Okay, welcome to uh, the Sacred Masculine class on the Aries God Archetype, the Fierce Protector. We're still in phase two uh, of the and the Initiation Act, uh, phase two of the Mars Synodic Cycle, the Initiation Act of the Hero's Journey. And we're going to be looking at the activation of the sixth labor. Uh, my name is Sophia Mona Lisa. I am the founder of the Golden Ray Center, which is an Aquarian age goddess temple for restoring the culture of sovereignty and sacred relationship. I'm also the founder of the Rose Real Mystery School, uh, which is an Aquarian age mystery school under the umbrella of the Golden Ray center. So this particular labor activation took place May 15th to the 16th. If you're on the Pacific coast of the United States or going that way, uh, it was the 15th. And if you're on the east coast of the United States and going the other way, it was on the 16th of May. And what's really um, interesting for me and for Maureen is that um, this labor activation is happening in Cancer at about 14 degrees. And both Maureen and I have a Cancer Mars overtone. And the archetype for Mars in Cancer is the good father. So that's our overtone for Mars, and we're having this activation uh, in, in Cancer. So this is, this is going to be uh, really personal for Maureen and myself. So here's our agenda uh, for today. <clears throat> and uh, we are going to be starting by establishing our grounding and spiritual fortification. So I'm gonna go ahead and light my candle. I haven't done that yet. Um, I don't know, this one's not going to light. There's plenty of wax in there, but the wick is burnt down. It's not going to light. Um, here, I got another one. I love this candle holder. It's an amethyst with the candle. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. There we go. All right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do this piece. Claim this space for the Sophia Craze consciousness. We thank the goddess Diana for putting on us her full armor of spiritual protection and fortification. We ground ourselves to Mother Earth. We call in our higher selves, our spirit guides and spirit allies, the angels and archangels, our spirit animal totems and our animal medicine and we seal this space with the light and love of the golden ray and so it is so today's invocation is going to be an invocation of chiron and we'll see that one of the main aspects that the sixth labor activation is doing is a T-square. And it's, you know, we've got an opposition at the top and then 
the, the stem of the T comes down creating two squares. Where that stem is coming down, um, all of that energy and the opposition is being directed down here. And it's actually a conjunction of Osiris and Chiron. And since we did an invocation to Osiris in the last class, I thought we would do an invocation to Chiron this class. So uh, whenever you're ready, Maureen, I'll have you do the invocation. Tutor of the children of gods, mentor of heroes, teacher of legends, wild centaur nurtured by light of sun and moon into something more than mere wilderness, mere wildness and savagery. Someone had to teach them, these half powerful youths, and who better than the one who is half sage and half beast? Wounded by your own student, doomed to an immortality of pain and suffering, you cheated your fate by gifting life on one reviled by the powerful and loved by the weak. Chiron, teacher, wise one, you who always knew the right thing to do, share with us this certainty and mentor us in our confusion. So it is. So it is. Thank you. So these are the creative energies for May. We looked at these in the sacred feminine class as well. So I just want to point out that here is the May 15th, 16th, where this labor activation took place. And so today, as of this recording, we're at May 25th. And tomorrow is that full moon and total lunar eclipse in Sagittarius at five Sagittarius. And we see <clears throat> that when that total lunar eclipse happens tomorrow, that it is activating again through opposition, the, uh, the sacred feminines uh, first gate root chakra activation and the Gemini evening star journey, which is the ascent journey. So just wanted to speak a little bit about um, what a, a lunar eclipse is. This one is going to be a total lunar eclipse. I know we haven't had a total lunar eclipse in a while, uh, but what happens is a, a lunar eclipse always occurs on a full moon. And at a full moon, we know that, that the sun and the moon are standing across the sky to us. So the moon then is here at this five Sagittarius, which means the sun is over here in five Gemini. Now, what happens when there's a lunar eclipse is that you've got the moon, then you've got the earth, and then you've got the sun. So the earth is standing between the moon and the sun. And normally at a full moon, the moon is eliminate, illuminated by the light of the sun. But what happens during a, an eclipse is that the moon moves into the shadow of the earth. And it's the shadow of the earth between the sun and the moon that does what's called an occultation of the moon. It doesn't allow the light of the sun to be, to be reflected on the moon. And that being occulted or that occultation is, um, relates to the word, the occult. And the occult has to do with that which is hidden, hidden knowledge. And so this particular eclipse in Sagittarius is going to be very, very powerful because the hidden knowledge related to this eclipse, from my perspective, 
is very much related to the sacred feminine. The, the truth about the sacred feminine that has been hidden is what's being activated within us at this time, the secret knowledge about the uh, sacred feminine, when we're talking about the moon, specifically the divine mother aspect um, of the sacred feminine principle or the Sophia consciousness is what's being activated within us. So this is going to be very, very powerful because of the fact that it's reactivating this root chakra first gate activation in the sacred feminine uh, Venus sonotic cycle. And also because then just three days later, which the eclipse is tomorrow, which is Wednesday, three days later, this coming Saturday, the 29th, is when Mercury is going to station retrograde for its second vision quest of this year. But what's really interesting about this particular Mercury stationing retrograde is that Venus and Mercury are conjunct at this 25 degrees Gemini. It's actually 24 in some odd minutes, but we round it up to 25 degrees Gemini. And so to me, this further emphasizes that this lunar eclipse is about this forgotten knowledge, this, and because it's been hidden, this hidden knowledge about the sacred feminine, the sacred feminine being represented by Venus. And so this Mercury retrograde time that we're going into from my perspective, is all about us being able to reclaim the forgotten knowledge because it's been hidden uh, during this vision quest. So this is some really powerful stuff that's coming up at the end of this month. Uh, this Mercury retrograde vision quest will be completed on July 7th. And this lunar eclipse, eclipses have a window of six months. So you may not be able to feel or recognize the full effect of this total lunar eclipse for another six months. So that's about the November timeframe. Also, I do wanna point out uh, on May 18th, we had Venus conjunct the North Node. And if you go to my blog page on my website, goldenraycenter.com, I did a little blog piece about this Venus conjunct North Node, um, which you can read. And I'll put a link to that uh, in the section below this video when I post it to our Sacred Masculine Library. Any questions or, or about that, Maureen, or any additional information about it that you've tuned into and picked up on? Okay. The one thing that I would like to also draw our attention to regarding what's happening here um, between the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine, particularly with Mars in Cancer as the good father, what I believe is happening, we know that the sacred masculine always serves and supports the sacred feminine. And we've talked about how what's happening at this time is the second coming of Christ and that it's coming as the emergence of the Sophia consciousness through us. 
And so the question is, is how is the sacred masculine in cancer as the good father serving and supporting us and the Sophia consciousness and her emergence through us? And as I said, we're dealing with the divine mother uh, aspect of Sophia with this lunar eclipse. And so it makes sense to me that the, that the father aspect of the Christ as being indicated by this labor activation in cancer is serving and supporting uh, the mother aspect of the Sophia. So I feel like at this particular time in this emergence that those are the two aspects that we're seeing. And we'll look closer at the activation aspects to, to try to discern more about how that's unfolding, uh, the, the, the service and the support of the sacred masculine, more specifically the divine father piece, um, supporting the emergence of the divine mother aspect of the Sophia. And even with the sun being right here on this first gate root chakra activation at this lunar eclipse, the, the sun represents the divine father. So again, this is pointing to this, this apparent uh, focus on the divine father, divine mother aspects of the Sophia Christ consciousness. Does that resonate with you, Maureen? Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, I need I need clarification on um, what shows us that the emphasis is, is the divine mother uh, part of. Uh, Sophia consciousness. What? What yes. is that? Right, because of this total lunar eclipse, we know that the moon represents the divine mother, and because it's at a full moon, uh, the sun is over here in Gemini, illuminating this sacred feminine first gate activation. So the divine mother at the activation is the moon and Venus. And then with the sun there, the divine father piece. And then again here with the activation for the sacred masculine happening in cancer, the good father. And then with this eclipse going on again, the divine father and the divine mother. So for me, that's why I'm seeing the focus on those two aspects of the Christ and the Sophia consciousness. Thank you. Does that resonate with you? And, and or do you see uh, intuit something different or something in addition to what I've shared? No, I think so. Yeah, I, I, I resonate with that. Absolutely. Right. right. Well, and we can even see up here on May 11th, we had the new moon in Taurus. Mm -hmm. Taurus, of course, is all about embodiment. And the new moon is when the sun, the divine father, and the moon, the divine mother, are standing in the same place in the sky. So it's like a sacred union of the divine mother and the divine father that we're embodying. And what we see here is it's activating this aspect of the sacred feminine, the sun, black moon, Lilith, Yeshua conjunction. So again, we've got this focus on the divine father and we do have this aspect, Yeshua as the divine son, uh, the embodiment of Christ as well. So I still feel like um, that that the focus is on the divine mother, divine father aspects. Okay, thank you. All right, so here's the overview 
of the hero's journey and the Mars synodic cycle to see just exactly where we are. So everything in red is related to the hero's journey. So we can see here that we are in the initiation act and within the initiation act, we're at the test allies and enemies step where the hero faces the new challenges and gets a squad. Everything in orange is related to the phases of the Mars synodic cycle. We know that there's six phases and that the phases begin at phase zero and then go to phase one, two, three, four, and five. So we see here that we are in that second phase of the Mars synodic cycle, and we will not get into the third phase of the Mars and synodic cycle until Mars moves into the underworld. What's interesting, just as a kind of a heads up, is at this eighth labor in July on on July 12th, two days later, Mars and Venus will be conjunct in Leo. So that's gonna be something really spectacular that we'll be able to look at in the next two months. And remember that in July is when that Mercury retrograde vision quest completes, and that's gonna be completing on July 7th. So Five days later is when we have the activation of this labor. And then seven days after the Mercury retrograde vision quest completes is when we're going to have that conjunction between Venus and Mars, the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine in Leo, the sign of the compassionate heart. And that's really important because we know that the heart is the seat of the soul. And we've discussed how the soul is actually the sacred union of the Christ consciousness and the Sophia consciousness, the Christ consciousness being that sacred masculine principle, the Sophia consciousness being uh, the sacred feminine principle. So their union as our soul that extension of source made in the image of source because it's the star tetrahedron, which is a fractal of the flower of life sphere hologram in our heart where the seat, where it stands, the seat of our soul. And so that's going to be a really exciting time just as a heads up for what's coming. So we're going to take some time and do some closure on the fifth labor of Mars. And remember, these are the labors of Hercules that we've been discussing around these activations when Mars conjuncts the moon in the sky. And this particular labor was about the Aegean stables. And so um, what we find out about this particular labor is that there was an agreement that Hercules made to the king Eurystheus that he could not be paid for, he could not receive compensation for these labors. And when King Ogeus says that he will give Hercules, I think it's a third of his cattle, uh, if he's able to complete this labor, once, he, once Hercules gets back to King Aegeus, he refuses to count this fifth labor as one of the labors because he not only accepted payment, he actually went to court because King Aegeus refused to pay him after the fact, and he took him to court to settle the question about whether or not he should be paid. And so since he was not supposed to get the reward, since he was not supposed to be paid, this particular labor did not count. And actually, 
what we find out when we look deeper into this is originally Hercules was supposed to do 10 labors, but we know that he's actually done 12 labors. And as we dig even a little deeper, we find out the 11th labor was to compensate for this fifth labor. And then it turns out later on, there's another labor that doesn't get to count. And that's why he has to do the 12th labor. So we're starting to get into some deeper um, details about what's really going on here. So, and the other piece about this is that this particular labor happened in Gemini. And so we can see now, whereas in the past we were looking at the negative traits of the activation, the sign where the activation is happening in Gemini, you know, we've got that symbol of Gemini where one is white and one is black. So we're looking at polarity. Now we're shifting. We're shifting to look at weaknesses and strengths because that's what the Gemini um, sign is based on, those polarities of light and dark, shadow and light. So in his weaknesses, we can see the indecisiveness, the impulsiveness and the unreliability. This unreliability shows up through King Aegeus because he promises to pay the reward and he only promised it because he really thought that Hercules would not be able to complete the task. And then when he does, he, you know, he decides that he's not going to pay him after all because he didn't expect him to be able to complete it. So he wasn't really, you know, being truthful about the reward. And then over here, we have the Gemini strengths of being adaptable, outgoing, and intelligent. And you could even say that the intelligence piece shows up when Hercules decides to take King Aegeus to court to get this matter of him being given the reward settled. And he even calls on King Ogeus' son who bore witness to his father's agreement to pay the reward as uh, a, a, a witness to give testimony to whether or not he's entitled to this reward. Um, so these are some of the weaknesses and strengths that could, could you could encounter these aren't the only weaknesses and strengths. These are just some of them that you can encounter at that labor activation. And so um, I ask you, Maureen, in terms of how you were being activated by this fifth labor aspect in Gemini last month until now, how, how has any of that shown up? Um, and just hold that for a minute because I want to go back to this theme of having to clean out this maneuver, manure. Uh, you know, you can think of the emoji for, for manure, for poop. <laughs> <laughs> and what that what that emoji looks like. And so how much of that, for lack of a better word, crap, <laughs> were you having to overcome in your life that seemed insurmountable? And in any way, were you using the water element the way that Hercules did here to clear all of that crap out? <laughs> Well, I've certainly been um, clearing out a lot of um, a lot of false starts, um, paths that that I took out of curiosity. Um, to learn about particular things. Uh, 
And so I got, you know, far enough along in some of them that uh, I wasn't aligned anymore. It just made no sense. So I had to clear that out and I, I am still doing that, but it showed up in a really big way, um, a really big way. <clears throat> um, about how I choose what it is that I am going to um, listen to, what I'm going to hear, what, what things I'm going to spend my time on. And, um, and so I know I've, I've talked to you a bit about this, um, what's going on with that clearing out. And, and certainly within this new space, a lot of it doesn't fit anymore. And so that sounds sort of out there. I don't wanna to get too specific, but um, it was very clear to me, some of the paths I was taking weren't my paths to take. And so um, I had to clear some of the things that were not aligned with me, but that I had already ingested, so to speak. So right. that's, that's exactly what um, happened. I mean, that was very clearly the, the fifth labor. You know, I was um, getting aligned better with what it is that, um, that, that I do believe, and um, and I'm really grateful for that. That was um, unexpected. <laughs> right. So you could even go so far as to say, perhaps, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, that the crap that you were clearing out was the distortion pieces of what you were digging into and looking at. Yes. Go ahead. That's right. Yes, it was distortion. And um, and it was just clear to me that that's, that was true. Well, true to me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, I am really um, glad to have those distortions cleared out because it can be super confusing. And that, of course, uh, was was part of the uh, invocation of Chiron that that would be cleared out that confusion and so I, I'm feeling more um, more firm in <clears throat> what is true for me. Right. And so let's focus a little bit on this Gemini strength of adaptability because we can see that Hercules even demonstrated that strength because initially he's there prepared to have to shovel out the crap. But when he realized there's no way that he can shovel it all out within the time frame of the one day that he's been given by the king, he becomes adaptable by realizing also through his intelligence that instead of shoveling, he can create those channels by which the water of the two rivers can flow through there and clean it out and clean it out within the time frame. So your ability to use that strength of adaptability from Jim and I, from my perspective, was also activated within you because I know with your Scorpio Venus overtone with your Scorpio ascendant that you're always, always going down rabbit holes, no matter where they may take you. And so this has been a huge shift for you that instead of going down every rabbit hole that you're using this discernment to decide which rabbit hole you're going to go down to again using that adaptability strength, but also the intelligence strength. I, I, from my perspective, that discernment comes through intelligence. How does that resonate with you? Oh, absolutely. 
it resonates perfectly. Um, it, it does, it goes with, with um, Scorpio very well. My, um, I'm driven <laughs> to dive deep into everything that I hear and, um, and that leads to confusion and fog and because um, it, it, it's not all going to be my path at all. You know, it's, it, it can't because there's so many controversies within each uh, area that you explore. And uh, there's just some, it's just not worth it. And, and even though I am driven to dive deep and learn, um, I'm beginning to have more discernment about that. Yeah. Uh, and, and understanding that I don't have to know how everything works within the framework of the subject. And, and that's, that's good. I think that's really good because sometimes it's just not going to take you anywhere. Right. I've had enough of that. <laughs> right. Right. And so the gift of that, again, from my perspective, is that you're, you're saving yourself a lot of time and being able to invest that time into uh, activities or contemplation or research that you can get more out of. Mm -hmm. Is that so? Yeah, because I was spreading myself way too thin and I wasn't really getting anywhere. Um, it was just spinning my wheels is what it, what it came down to, what, what I realized, um, and not being able to spend the time on what is important. And so, yes, that definitely was been going on with this labor. Yeah. And we could even go so far as to say that the gift of that additional time was really the reward mm -hmm. from being able to achieve that labor. Yes, definitely a gift of more time. Um, and also um, a kind of peace. Uh, because it, it's a struggle when you feel like you need to know everything about everything you're hearing. And, um, and I let go of that struggle. I don't have to know everything about everything. I mean, it's impossible to do that in the first place. But if you're driven to try, <laughs> it can be very stressful. And, um, and it really doesn't help you to move forward at all. So, yes. Right, and so since we know that the labors are intended to be insurmountable challenges, mm -hmm. that was an insurmountable challenge that you were able to actually achieve. Yes, it was. And I never, I, I mean, that was really a surprise. Yeah. Um, it's a whole new uh, area to be in. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new space. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, taking into consideration quantum movement. And, yeah. um, and it, it, it just, it just happened, you know? Um, and it surprised me and yet it, it works, it's working. Um, mm -hmm. So it was- And so it's really, from my perspective, not a surprise because this activation of this labor taking place in Gemini, Gemini being an air sign, we know that has to do with the mental realm. Yeah. And so really clearing out your mental space. Yeah. Absolutely clearing out my mental space. Yeah. Um, which can get very cluttered, extremely cluttered. And so that was a big move. 
which is great because it goes back to the fact that these stables, um, I'm having problems with my mouse, hold on a second. Um, I don't know why I'm having a challenge with my mouse. I don't know what's going on here. Here we go. These stables had not been cleaned for many years. And that was why so much manure had been accumulated. And so you could say the stable of your mind had not been cleared out for a long time. Long time. Yeah. From all my um, research, you know, along lines that were not mine to go, paths that were not mine to follow. Yeah. Um, I think we have to realize that. I think that was a big deal for me was to understand that, yeah, I, not all paths are going to be um, aligned with what I want. You know, and I don't need to find that. Right. That's really exciting. I think it is too, because I've I've never um, for most of my adult life I've not looked at it that way at all. Um, it's caused a lot of trouble. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> hmm. I'm very grateful. Yeah. That. That's beautiful. Is there anything else that's wanting to be acknowledged around this particular labor? No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. So you could even perhaps say that you were able to overcome this Gemini weakness of impulsiveness by going down every little rabbit hole. Oh yeah, absolutely impulsive. And uh, which being uh, over an analytical, mm -hmm. um, which I do, uh, you know, I look at all the details. That's my Capricorn. Looks mm -hmm. at all the details, wants to know what every little thing is put it in line and make it a step, you know, a path of step one mm -hmm. by one. And, um, and yeah, all those indecisive, impulsive, unreliable, all of those things came into play here. Um, what I, what I was clearing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love how this speaks to what you said about being over analytic analytical mm -hmm. Gemini's can be overly analytical which leads to indecisiveness so mm -hmm. it's great it's great and then look at this outgoing piece they're usually partaking in deep conversations about life so by not going down all of those rabbit holes that don't really resonate with what you're about you can take the time to go deeper, which is what you love to do in the areas that do resonate with you and thereby have even more significant conversation. Absolutely. Much better. Yeah. Wow. Who would have thought that it would show up that way? It's fascinating to me. Oh, it's fascinating to me too. Um, I wasn't even, you know, fully aware until this, this labor and it started to become clear. It, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just didn't enter my thoughts, mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that this was even happening. Right. Until I realized, oh, I'm in a different space, you know. <laughs> So that was good. It was really good. Yeah. 
And I've been hearing you say over and over again, the clarity being really clear. And we know from our work with the elements that clarity has to do with the water element. Yes. Absolutely. Clear current. Clear running. Clear current. Yes. Much better now. That's fantastic. Yes. Yes. It's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It's fascinating <laughs> and it's exciting. Feel it, feel these kinds of, of um, changes from awareness. You know, mm -hmm. um, being being aware of, of Mars cycle. Uh, yeah. And, and that is a manifestation of this activation in Gemini, because Gemini is all about changing awareness, changing perceptions, changing perspectives. Yeah, right. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Okay, well, let's move on here and let's talk about this new labor, the sixth labor. So I happened to come across this video and here's the link to the video. And of course, it'll be on the research page for the Sacred Masculine. But it's an hour long on the 12 labors of Hercules. And this it's in this video that I picked up on these more uh, intricate details about what's really going on in this myth than I was discovering in the written stories that I was finding. And so I'm gonna pick up with this video uh, as we go forward, just because it's, it's just uh, so much more satisfying with, with uh, the uh, richness of the telling of the myth. And this sixth layer has to do with the Stymphalian birds. And in this video, it's located at 23 minutes and 23 seconds. Now we know I can't play this in the recording because it, it'll be a copyright strike. So I'm going to pause the recording here and play this piece for you. And then uh, I'll resume the recording for our discussion piece. Okay, so yes, his labor was to kill those birds at that lake, uh, hundreds of them. And it's interesting to me that he was having a hard time discovering these birds because of that marshy lake. So we know that this activation is taking place in Cancer. It's a water sign. And that the whole story of this labor is based on this environment of water that is initially preventing him from being able to fulfill this labor. We also know that the activation in cancer has to do with the good father. And we hear in this labor that Zeus, the father of Hercules, is keeping an eye on him and trying to provide assistance through the gods in a kind of um, under the radar way, so as not to upset Hera, who is trying to thwart Hercules in creating uh, and, and completing these labors. So that's also kind of pulling in that good father aspect. So I find that interesting. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you found interesting in terms of that labor? Uh, it, I have to listen to it again because uh, I wasn't sure. I, I didn't hear absolutely all the words. I'll listen to it with earphones and it'll be better. But, um, but was there a purpose 
to killing these birds? I mean, were they were they doing something wrong or just there? Well, you know, actually, that's a very good question because they don't really go into it um, in the in this video. But we can do a really quick Google on the Stymphalian birds and see if we can find anything out about those birds uh, that we should be aware of. Okay, that'd be good. Voracious, I saw that word. Did you? Voracious. So they are voracious. They were a group of monstrous birds. They devoured humans okay. and had beaks made of bronze. Their feathers were sharp and metallic and could be thrown against their prey. Here we get back to dung. Oh, yeah. How interesting. <laughs> dung was poisonous. Wow. And they were created by the god of war, Ares and were hunted down by wolves. Hmm. So it seems that when they reached this Lake Stymphalia, they reproduced quickly and destroyed farmlands and the countryside. Okay. So yeah, there's definitely a uh, reason for them to be, you know, to be eliminated. Yeah, it's that lake that was marshy that was preventing him from being able to see them and I guess in order to reach them too. So when he rang that rattle that Athena left, the birds rose up and that way he didn't have to find them in their nests throughout the marsh. They were all right there for him to go after. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So here, you know, those arrows with, with the poison of the hydra blood have really come in good stead for him through many of these labors, hasn't it? It really has. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. So now let's look at the cancer energies. Let me uh, bring this back up. There we are the cancer traits. The negative characteristics of cancer are brooding, easily hurt, touchy, manipulative, having a negative perspective, I would say, negative emotions taking them over, overly cautious, lazy, selfish, and sorry for self. And then the positive characteristics are for cancerians, for cancer energy, being sensitive, nurturing, sympathetic, intuitive, imaginative, emotional, maternal, domestic, tenacious, helpful, having a good memory, and being traditional. So it'll be interesting to see which of, oops, sorry, which of these traits uh, show up for you as you're encountering this next insurmountable challenge, which is going to be revealed to you through this activation. So let's look at the aspects that are part of the activation of this sixth labor. Here we are. Okay, so it gets a little bit jumbled on the chart, but we'll do our best to break this down. The first thing is we can see here this moon Mars opposition to Arthur being retrograde and the T-square that it makes to Osiris and Chiron. So let's look at that. And of course, this Cancer Capricorn opposition 
has to do with this path of family, home, and community. And we know that that's about creating safe places for children over the next seven generations. So creating these safe places that will be available for children within the family, within the home, within the community uh, for those generations going forward. So we see here, here is the moon and Mars conjunction uh, in Cancer. It's at 13 degrees 50, almost 14 degrees. And then here is Arthur in retrograde at almost 12 degrees. So there's the opposition. And then here's the T-square coming down here to Osiris and Chiron in Aries. So this is really spectacular because what this focus is on is this shamanic medicine of Aries that has to do with self-love. And it's bringing in these Osiris energies, which we talked about in the sacred feminine class in a different way than we've looked at Osiris before. We've looked before at Osiris as the wise and compassionate leader. And what we discovered through the most holy Trina Sophia that we talked about in the sacred feminine class is that Isis, the sacred partner, the beloved of Osiris, was known to be Sophia in the Egyptian culture. And while it did not say it outright, we can discern that if Isis, the sacred partner of Osiris is known as Sophia, then therefore Osiris must be the Christ because they're in sacred partnership with each other. And in fact, Christ consciousness does have to do with uh, being a compassionate, good leader, uh, even in terms of the divine will of the Christ consciousness. And so what was shared with me kind of tweaking that information that that was offered in the past is that that Christ energy as divine will, the Sophia energy as divine wisdom are being drawn together into union through the electric uh, electro mo I'm having challenges with my words, so bear with me. The electromagnetic energy of pure, unconditional love. And so what happens is because that electromagnetic energy of pure, unconditional love is drawing them together, bringing them into sacred union, that then what's happening is the manifestation of that sacred union is the broadcasting of that pure love frequency. And that's what this Chiron in Aries medicine is all about. It's about self-love, but in fact, it's about understanding that we are an embodiment of that pure love energy that is the manifestation of the union between Isis, Osiris, Sophia, Christ consciousness. So this is a big piece that's happening through this activation. And let's just take a moment to look at this Arthur energy. So I'm going to uh, take this out and come back over here. Remember, you've got these books that I published up here for you. This is the one on the astrological keywords. And if we go into this book, trying to bring it up, enlarge it. There we go. And if we look at Arthur, maybe I can enlarge it even further. 
we see that Arthur has to do with cosmic law that created the ordered universe from chaos. It has to do with Dharma. Dharma is a Sanskrit word for right conduct, which gets um, also translated as duty, has to do with morality, has to do with preserving and maintain righteousness. I would venture to say that righteousness is another aspect of right conduct, as is duty and virtue. So let's look at that. What we're seeing here in this opposition is how how the mat remember we're looking at this from how the sacred masculine is serving and supporting us and the serving and supporting the emergence of the sophia through us well we've seen how the two pieces of this unity have been separated in from each other bringing about separation consciousness and how the knowledge of the Christ consciousness and its Holy Trinity of Father, Son, Holy Spirit has been really perverted to bring about patriarchy. But this piece of it, the sacred feminine principle, the Sophia consciousness and its aspects of mother, daughter, holy soul were hidden that knowledge was hidden it was occulted this is what's happening at this eclipse is that that knowledge is being brought back into at the very least our subconsciousness so that it can start to emerge and i would venture to say that this arthur energy notice that it's retrograde it's going within us and it's preparing us to, to get rid of the chaos that has been created within us by taking us into separation consciousness and hiding the truth about the Sophia consciousness as a piece of the Christ consciousness. Does that make sense to you? Um, I need you to say that again. Okay, let me see if I can find another way to say it. All right. Are you so far clear on the on the part about how we've discovered that the sacred union of the Christ consciousness and the Sophia consciousness, the masculine and feminine principles, mm -hmm. that, that unity consciousness was ripped asunder into separation consciousness yes. through patriarchy. Yes. By occulting, hiding the true knowledge about the sacred feminine peace. Yes. Okay. So how is the sacred masculine serving and supporting the emergence of this peace through us? Well, what first has to happen is that the hidden knowledge of their unity, the hidden knowledge that the feminine peace is even there has to be brought back into our knowledge base. Yes. Okay. And so what we're seeing is, is that through this Arthur energy that is opposite this masculine activation remember what happens in an opposition we blend the energies of the polarities to bring it to a higher manifestation a higher frequency of manifestation 
Okay. And a T square, what it's doing is it's blending it and it's focusing those energies towards a specific manifestation of higher frequency. Mm -hmm. In this instance, it's pointing us back to Osiris, that Christ consciousness, and it's pointing us back to the shamanic medicine of self-love or pure love. So we know that, that the Christ consciousness and the Sophia consciousness are drawn together. They're magnetized towards each other through that electromagnetic frequency of pure love. That's what draws them together. Right. And then <clears throat> because of that unity, the manifestation of that sacred marriage is that that pure love frequency gets broadcasted not only to us, but through us, from us. So the Arthurian piece is taking this occulted knowledge about the Sophia consciousness, the sacred feminine principle, and it's creating order out of chaos, order out of the chaos of this unification being ripped asunder. How does it do it? It has to bring into our awareness that this sacred feminine piece is a part of the sacred masculine piece in terms of unity consciousness. And so by focusing on Christ consciousness and focusing on the manifestation of the union with that pure love being broadcast from us through, you could even say divine will, Aries will, but with Osiris, divine will. It's allowing us even on a very subconscious level to recognize and or remember, and this is where that Mercury retrograde uh, point mercury stationing retrograde conjunct venus the sacred feminine comes into play helping us to remember helping us to reclaim helping us to reunify the occulted or hidden truth with the peace that we are aware of bringing the sophia back to the christ consciousness and allowing that reunification remember you talked about that in the sacred feminine how the second coming of christ is about the reunification right. of the christ with the sophia and right. having the manifestation of that be that pure love frequency that broadcasts from us because if you look over here Pisces is the unmanifest, Aries is the manifest. And this is what's happening here, bringing the two of them together so that this, this pure love frequency, the medicine that we've always carried within us that we have forgotten about because we were, you know, given this perverted message from patriarchy that has hidden half of the story, half of the knowledge base and allowing it to be able to come back together and being able to, in terms of Chiron and Aries self-identity medicine, how we know ourselves as the embodiment of that union and the embodiment of the manifestation of that union, which is the frequency of pure love broadcasting through us and from us. Okay. So in this case, author is representing. 
He's creating order out of the chaos. He's of the okay. chaos that was created within us. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, through this story that we were given where the true knowledge of the Sophia piece of ourself was occulted, was hidden. And he's doing that by allowing that hidden knowledge to become okay. a part of, even as I said, perhaps even at the unconscious level, mm -hmm. that, it, that, it, that that truth has always been who we are and has always been within us. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just, you know, I got what I got caught up on, I think is Arthur. Um, I always, I always think of him as, I don't know, kind of a male uh, authority figure. I guess, uh, even though he was known to be fair. Um, I think I, 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 I feel distortions around the myth, you know, about what Arthur really is. And so I, I guess I didn't, I couldn't figure out how he fit into this whole um, unconditional love realization you know, this, this manifestation, which I, which I, I get, I get. So thank you. Right. So, and it's a good thing that you pointed to the distortions around the Arthur archetype, mm -hmm. the energies, because remember when we go back here to the astrological keywords that that archetypal energy has to do with, we see that, that the archetypical energy doesn't have the distortions. And this is where we see what that energy is about, that, you know, preserving and maintaining righteousness. Well, what does that have to do with? It's about bringing what's been hidden back into the light, back in bringing that knowledge forward again. And by doing that, being able through this cosmic law to create order, order in our universe, order with, within the, the universe that we carry within out of the chaos that was a manifestation of that distortion, of okay. that piece of the truth being hidden. Right. Now, you see, if you look, if you look at duty, morality, righteousness, and virtue, you can get a whole religious distortion around those things. And I guess that's where I got tripped up is um, everybody interpretates, interprets, <laughs> interprets those things differently. Um, like morality can be different from culture to culture, um, uh, virtue, different from culture to culture. And so what is Arthurian virtue? What is Arthurian morality without the distortion? Um, I guess that, that, would, that, that, are, that would be for me an area to explore a little bit because I'm I'm clearly not um, seeing him in his true light. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Well, and that's that's a very good uh, um, awareness heightening yeah. because in any in any let me bring this back over here in any aspect when you are looking at the energies associated with a specific luminary body, mm -hmm. you have to look at it in association with the other luminary bodies 
that are being aspected by it. And so, you know, um, as such, not every piece may be um, not every piece in terms of the astrological keywords provided may be appropriate to the energies that are interacting with each exactly. other. And yeah. that requires some intuitiveness in terms of how you're feeling that they're interacting with each other. This is my perspective. You could look at this T-square and come up with a completely different perspective and it would be just as valid and it would not in any way invalidate my perspective right and so I would say or invite you as you look deeper into Arthur's archetypical energies Mm -hmm. to look at it in terms of this t-square with these other luminary bodies and find out what the mix is. Remember what we said before about the when we first started defining the energies and aspect with each other. We said that, for instance, with a conjunction, they're blending energies, just like when you blend red paint with yellow paint, you get orange paint. Right. Okay. Well, when you start blending based on these aspects, you have to take into consideration the energies of all of the luminary bodies. You have to take into consideration the energies of the aspects. What is the energy of an opposition? What is the energy of a T-square? This T-square has two squares. We know that squares are breakthroughs for consciousness. What is the energy of a square? And now we've uh, amplified it by having two of those squares. Mm -hmm. What is the breakthrough in consciousness that's happening with this Mm T-square? So you take all of those factors and you put it in the soup like a vegetable soup and you figure out what does that taste like to you right right yeah if 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 you've got you know more onion and less celery more potato and less carrots how does that change the taste of the soup that you're making from all of those ingredients. And how you translate that taste through your senses could be very different than how I translate it. It might be delicious to me, but not so good for you because you'd like more carrots and less onion. You see what I'm saying? So everybody's perspective, everybody's translation is as valid as the others. Not one invalidates the other. Okay. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, totally. Um, So I'm looking forward to looking into that T-square. Big one. And we know that, you know, as a myth that Arthur is a king. Yes. And so, you know, you've got the royal bloodline, you could say, being brought back into a true representation. Yeah. Uh, You could look, if if you're at all working with the tarot. I don't work with the tarot. I know there are people that are really good at working at the tarot. And the king cards have specific energy meanings as compared to the page cards and the queen cards. So maybe some of that, if it's something that is a a gift that you can intuit from, would be included in how you translate the effect of these energies. 
and may even be some new astrological keywords that could be included. So is Arthur more the king of swords, the king of wands, uh, the king of uh, what are pentacles, the king of cups? And maybe he's some of all of those. And so what keywords from the tarot as Arthur being a manifestation of those symbols would you like to add to the astrological keywords of what the Arthur archetypical energies are about remember that in my book of astrological keywords it is not all encompassing and as you play with these Arthur energies, more and more keywords will come to you and they'll come to you through Arthur's interaction with different luminary bodies as well. So I would love to invite you uh, because, you know, our group session is on Saturday. If, if you dig into that, feel into that, discern into that, you know, a couple of other keywords around the Arthur energies that you'd like to add to that book. I will look at that. Thank yeah. You. Um, that would feel more satisfying to you. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's, um, I will do that because that, that's really interesting to me. Um, the whole archetype of Arthur, um, what kind of king is he? Well, we know he's fair. Um, and really, what does fair translate to? It translates into balanced energies, yeah. right? The yeah. balance of the sacred feminine with the sacred masculine yeah. is how I perceive that. You could perceive that completely different. I wonder if uh, Guinevere and uh, Lancelot have any um, something to do in that legend with balance. I don't know. It's just something that just came up because um, our society would perceive that as a betrayal. Um, that his his wife and his knight uh, fell in love. Um, so maybe there's another way to look at that. Interesting. Well, you know, and in the myth, he's a much older, much more mature man. And she, as a woman, is still kind of like in that maiden stage, so yeah. to speak. She you know, is, so is Lancelot, right, in the young man. Yeah. And so his advanced age, comparative to Guinevere, comparative to Lancelot, has to go back to these Capricorn energies of being the wise one, right? And that the, the tribal yeah. elder. Right, and he, he is, he, the archetype is wise, yeah. Hmm. There's a lot there. There is a lot there right now that, that can be explored. Yeah. And so in terms of the Dharma, what Dharma is he fulfilling in Capricorn here in this T-square? Mm -hmm. Again, from my perspective, it's the Dharma. It's the duty of restoring the whole truth, the whole wisdom, Which, bringing back what was hidden into the light. I agree. And that might be represented by the crusade. Um, there may be 
that may be a symbol of something. What was he trying to do? Well, the legend says he was trying to recover um, artifacts that were precious. That were hidden. Hidden, yes. Hidden. Sacred religious artifacts that were hidden. Yes, exactly. So, and, and that was definitely, he saw that as a duty. Um, that, that really is a whole fascinating piece, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you see how he's aspected mm -hmm. with these other pieces, mm -hmm. you know, he's in trying to the Sekhmet Uranus conjunction in Taurus. Remember, Taurus is all about embodiment. Mm -hmm. How is he revealing the wisdom of what we are embodied as and who's standing next to Uranus Sekhmet? We've talked about in our sacred feminine classes how Sekhmet is a manifestation of Inanna, right? And how Inanna is a manifestation of Isis. And so you're bringing back in with Sekhmet that divine mother peace. Yeah. That we are embodiment, embodying it and how the wisdom of remembering, reclaiming the knowledge that we embody the Sophia, specifically this divine mother aspect can be liberating for us. Yeah. And then we see over here that the pieces of this activation that are being blended with Arthur mm -hmm. are the Mars moon conjunction and that is in conjunct Saturn and Aquarius. And so, you know, going from this either or to this and that, right? Mm -hmm. I can yeah. be the good father yeah. and I can birth the Sophia through me. Yeah. Being semi sextile to Venus, the sacred feminine, the North Node showing that this is the time and our evolutionary path for this hidden truth to come back to us and for Mercury as the cosmic messenger to communicate that hidden truth to us. In Gemini, you're talking about that whole mental space again to bring this revolution Mm -hmm. revolutionary truth right Uranus has to do with revolutionary to bring this truth back to us so that it can come out of the consciousness and un, excuse me out of the unconsciousness and into the consciousness mm -hmm. so all of that energy and its aspect to the Venus, North Node, and Mercury, and Saturn that is supporting this, that is including this, is blending with Arthur to put this focus of their energies on this Osiris Chiron conjunction in Aries, right? This creative impulse, which is what Aries is all about. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I see that um, Merlin is right there also. He's actually a little bit uh, out. I mean, I guess you could include him, but based on the, uh, the orbs that I was using of okay. aspects, he's just a little bit outside of it because uh, I guess the, the, furthest side I went to was like nine degrees 
he's at about seven. So you could pull him in. Mm -hmm. And again, that's just an intuitive piece. Do you mm -hmm. want to include that piece or not? And so let's go over here. And let's go look at Merlin. Remembering that this is not all inclusive. Come on up. <laughs> hmm. Well, because we're getting really short on time, I'll let you go yeah, back and I'm, look at I'm, that. I didn't mean to hang me up on this. No, 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 no. It's a fascinating discussion. I love it. Gives a lot of juicy meat to, to this. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll load later. You can look at that. Um, okay. well, I have that book. Yeah. I'll yeah. Look. You have access to that. So, um, the, and, and we'll go more into this in your personal session. Mm -hmm. I do want to show you here that we do have the Magdalene in Libra, the right. Our inner Magdalene, cause this is retrograde, the Magdalene that is the embodiment of Sophia consciousness in trying to the cosmic messenger, further facilitating or supporting this idea that this piece, right, in Libra, bringing it back, the truth back into balance is being communicated to us through this activation and the Mars moon aspect semi sextile. Remember, that's a very harmonious, very supportive aspect to this Mercury specifically, because they're both at about 17, but also then the North Node and Venus. And the other piece that I did not put on this because it would get to be too much is that between the aspects that Pluto makes to the North, uh, excuse me, to Neptune and Pisces, Hercules and Aries, and Yeshua and the Son, right? The divine, the divine Father and the divine Son in Taurus, embodying those pieces of the Christ consciousness. You see that each of those are in semi sextile to each other, as are these pieces. <laughs> that this opposition aspects, Osiris and Chiron and Aries, Sekhmet and Uranus and Taurus and Venus, North Node, Mercury and Gemini. Each of those are in semi-sextile to each other. And so through these pieces down here, we, we see that those energies blending into the more significant aspects right? The trine, the square. Here you've got the in conjunct. You've got the T-square. You've got this trine. Those energies are really supporting the revelation of this hidden truth. Again, from my perspective. And we see here that this new moon at 21 Taurus, which is very close to Yeshua and the sun, was about planting this seed of consciousness here. That, you know, trying Arthur, that we are going to be restoring that hidden piece about the Christ consciousness about the divine father, the divine son, that then their mirror parts are the divine mother, the divine daughter. So there's a lot really going on there. 
Yes, there is. Okay. All right. Thank so, you. Sure. That was a great conversation. I appreciate that. So here are some vision quest opportunities that you can look into. Uh, use the, utilizing the astrological keywords discern the seed of new consciousness about the divine father and the divine son that was planted within you at the new moon in Taurus. We just kind of referred to that. And then utilizing the astrological keywords, describe how the frequencies of Osiris, Chiron, Sekhmet, Uranus, Venus, North Node, and Mercury, right? These energies in blue here how are they supporting this sixth labor activation mm -hmm. and and let's not in any way underestimate how bringing the consciousness of the sophia consciousness unification with the christ consciousness the sacred feminine and unification with the sacred masculine that we are embodies of that unification embodiments of that unification that can be, for many people, a insurmountable challenge to recognize that the sacred feminine piece has been not only intentionally hidden from us, but that they are unified energies that mm -hmm. we do carry both within us. Yeah. All right. Okay, so our next support group is on Saturday, May 29th. And then these are the June classes for the Sacred Feminine, Second, second Gate Activation, and the Sacred Masculine's Seventh Labor. All right, so that was a lot to take in. Are, is anything else coming up? that desires clarity, or is there anything coming up that's an aha that would like to be acknowledged? Not, no, not at this point. I did. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. So that's this class. Um, and it's interesting how this initiation act phase has kind of shifted in terms of what's going on with the sacred feminine mm -hmm. with this being able to serve and support the emergence of the Sophia through us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The other piece I wanted to remind you of is um, when you're looking into those Arthur and maybe even Merlin energies, mm -hmm. you might want to go back to that first sacred masculine class where we're talking about the difference in the energies between the Piscean Aries archetype tech archetype and the Aquarian Aries archetype, because I know that we gave some examples in there related to the myth of Camelot. And so uh, it may put you on a trajectory to be able to discern more about Arthur and Merlin. And remember, we've included them in this sacred masculine journey as allies. Hercules, Merlin, Arthur. I can't remember who else we included <laughs> as sacred masculine allies for this journey. Okay, yeah. We'll look at that uh, again. Um, Sunday is a family dinner. So I may not have as much time to do this work um, this week but uh, before the, the group. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I, I will try, but. Yeah, it's okay. Don't pressure yourself. I mean, plus, you know, when this information has time to marinate within you, 
I mean, we're talking about a very short window from today till Saturday. Yeah. It, it may require more time to marinate. I kind of think it will for me because Arthur's a big deal. Uh, I've been drawn to the legend of Arthur for a long time. And um, uh, so I, I think there's something there for me to uncover um, about, about the archetype. And uh, uh, what things about that, you know, um, how to put that in a better perspective than, than uh, a patriarchal type archetype. Absolutely. Because uh, definitely you can see him that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, in, like you say, in, in this new, Aquarian energy that would change his his old the energy around him it would change to to a, a higher frequency exactly and uh, and so um, I think that's going to be a real enjoyable uh, quest for me mm -hmm. is to figure out how that change is and what that means. Yeah, I'll be excited to hear what comes up for you because, you know, your Mercury, your cosmic messenger is in the Capricorn energies. Yeah. And of course, Arlen, Arthur mm -hmm. in Capricorn is very different than Arthur in Cancer or any other sign. Yeah. So, you know, um, you may look at it as Arthur himself, and then more specifically, Arthur and Capricorn. Yes, and that would would definitely fit because my Mars is also in Capricorn. Right. So, um, yeah, and uh, I I was seeing uh, some some parallels there with Mer Merlin is why I brought it up. Merlin is a mentor of Arthur. Been with him a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, all through the Harry Potter novels, Dumbledore even looked like Merlin. You know, um, he he very much took on that archetype, mm -hmm. and and then it's very um, good, good energy. But mm -hmm. there is a lot hidden, a lot hidden, because so, we're wizards mm -hmm. right which Dumbledore and Merlin are yeah. deal with the occult right exactly. which we know is having to do with secret knowledge hidden knowledge and they guard it until they feel the time is right and so there's a little bit of control there um it's probably why I relate kind of to the patriarchy here, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as I said before, I think the hero's journey represented in, in the uh, Potter novels is exactly online with the, with the, uh, the journey. Yeah. So I, I tend to go there a lot. Uh, no, it's great because you have that kind of intimate familiarity that, I mean, yes, I've seen all the movies. I've not read the books like you have, mm -hmm. never really delved into how they reflected the hero's journey. So you bring a huge piece of wisdom around all of that that I don't carry with me. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, I, I, have, I was very involved in that from the beginning. From, from 10 years, I lived with J.K. Rowling you know, um, and her story. And it was a worldwide phenomenon. So the hero's journey came to the forefront during those 10 years. Yeah. Uh, because it was an incredibly gigantic phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, that, that millions and millions and millions of people were following and, and more each year that she gathered momentum with the book. Um, I mean, the, the scope of that is, is just 
amazing to me how how that came about. I mean, it's no accident. That Harry Potter character came into her mind fully formed. She yeah. knew where it was going from the get go. Yeah. And, um, and it it I'm not saying it was effortless. It wasn't. She she wrote, you know, and and learned through through her writing. But uh, it's an incredibly uh, exact path, you know. Uh, including the death and rebirth. It, it's yeah. just amazing. She yeah. knew it, and she knew the legends. and the... So anyway, I, I refer to that a lot when I am trying to understand the hero's journey. Yeah, yeah. that's great. That's great. And the more you're able to share with us, the better. Well, you know, I, I, I'm glad because to me, that's what brought that to the, to the world. To understand a little better about that journey, whether they know the myth or not, you know. Of, mm -hmm. But um, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, thank you, my dear, yeah. for co-creating a fabulous class. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. It was a really good class. You put it together really well, and and got me thinking about a lot of things and and it's going to be a, a fun trip I think okay good yeah good okay well then I will see you in the group session on Saturday absolutely I will be there okay bye-bye okay. bye-bye